Welcome to the IEA 4E's Mapping and Benchmarking webinar. This webinar is presenting the summary results of the inter-country comparative analysis on the performance of washing machines. This particular analysis on washing machines was completed in 2011 and published at the beginning of 2012 and therefore draws on time series data that ends in uh, 2009 to 2010. Now, this analysis is one of a number that have com been completed from products ranging from air conditioners through notebook computers to retail display cabinets. However, irrespective of the actual product itself, the Annex always takes the same approach to the analysis. The first stage is the product definition. Now it sounds odd that we have to create a product definition for something like a refrigerator or a washing machine, it's obvious what they are. However, the terminology and the definitions used around the world vary, well actually quite significantly, and, and to the point where in some cases terminology in one place could actually mean something completely different elsewhere. So the product definition creates this, this common framework that all countries can use. The second stage is the, the creation of individual country mapping documents. Now these documents try and capture as much time series data as we can on the performance of the individual product being analysed. It also looks at the sources of those data, um, documents any shortcomings that might be associated with that data, and, and also gives details some of the background, maybe some of the policies that have implemented it, or if a particular country has um, a cultural climate that, that will have a particular impact on a, on a product, that's also included in the mapping document. Now, there will be one of these mapping documents for every country presented in this report, and, and it can be downloaded directly from the, the uh, mapping and benchmarking website. So once we have all these individual uh, country mapping reports, we try and bring them together and analyse them. And that's what we're going to look at today, one of the benchmarking reports. Now, these benchmarking reports not only look at the individual countries separately, but they try and normalise the data so it's directly comparable to give policy makers a vision of how products are performing in their countries compared with elsewhere, what policies seem to be working, and what opportunities exist. Firstly, the definition. Um, it's pretty straightforward. We're talking about an appliance for cleaning and rinsing of textiles using water, which is principally designed within the, uh, for use within the domestic environment. Uh, the appliance may draw water from cold or hot supply, um, and may or may not have some means of extracting excess water, so may or may not have some kind of fitness spin function. Um, what did we include? We included all types of automatic, semi-automatic and manual machines, uh, horizontal and vertical orientation, uh, what are referred to here as top and front loaders, um, all types of configurations, so drum, impeller, agitator, nutators, um, warm and cold wash cycles, water intake of all kinds, so hot and cold fail, and all kind of spin speed, no differentiation there. What we excluded was twin tubs, that's uh, units where the washing and the spin uh, happens in, in separate um, uh, compartments, um, washer dryer units where the drying is a, is a tumble dryer, and coin operated units. The reason for excluding those is they're not core products across all countries, so including them distorts the the comparability of products between countries. Um, in terms of capacities, we followed the average across a number of uh, standards around the world, so we include everything from 1 to 13 kilograms. Uh, there's very few small products available anywhere anymore as far as we could find so anything up to three or four kilograms have sort of disappeared from most markets however increasingly large products are appearing around the world and that's of relevance to stakeholders which we'll see in a short time in the presentation so we tried to include larger units Based on this definition, we went to various countries and uh, sought information on uh, 
product energy consumption, uh, low capacities, water consumption, rinse efficiency, dry quality, um, and brought those together into the mapping documents. As I say, they're available on the website. Um, and then the challenging aspect that is benchmarking. Now for washing machines in any particular unit there's a number of interdependent variables the washing temperature, the orientation of the unit, the wash time, the wash quality how effective the spin is, the type and the size of load but they're all interdependent so if you change one it impacts the other and for an individual machine that's almost impossible to isolate uh, the specific impacts this is further complicated by um, the regulatory approach taken in different countries. In some countries they fix those variables, so you've got to have a certain wash quality, you've got to have a certain spin effectiveness. That's um, um, the, the case in Australia. Uh, energy and water is labelled. Um, EU, there's a voluntary maps for energy. Um, wash quality, energy and spin are labelled, um, other variables aren't reported to the consumer. And in the US, while well, there's MEPS and, um, for energy and water consumption, other variables aren't communicated to the consumer so they don't actually know the situation. So, in some countries our performance variables are fixed, some of them, uh, which, which affects all the other variables. In other countries everything's a variable so you can choose how you would uh, address the process. So things aren't true. That's complicated by the difference in test methodologies. Korea has different methods for horizontal and vertical units um, and different wash temperatures. Um, the EU used to at the time of this analysis have a, a 60 degree fixed temperature wash. Australia has a 40 degree warm wash, but almost all uh, washing happens in cold. Um, US and Canada, they have this more realistic mix of wash temperatures and cycles, but those cycles are selected by the manufacturer and not necessarily declared, so we as analysts have any idea what happened. And China has variable um, test methodologies and temperatures depending on machine functionality. Gets even more complicated because even when things are declared and appear to be similar, so the ability to clean stain removal and the measure of spin effectiveness on how much water has been extracted, they're not actually necessarily the same measure or indeed because of the load differences at all comparable. So we have all these interacting variables that are all going around together, some of which are fixed, some of which aren't. We can't separate on an individual machine level and we certainly can't separate it across the, the several thousand units we looked at across the different markets. So we step back a bit and, and talk to our participants, so basically our managing board, um, all the countries that are involved, and say, mm, well, okay, what are we interested in? What we're interested in is, is the energy used in the machine. Now, the energy can only go into two places. It can go in as mechanical energy, so the pumping, the uh, spinning, the, uh, the load agitation, or it can go in heating the water. Now, we looked at quite a lot of empirical data from, from tests and various machines from around the world and it appears the mechanical energy constitutes about 140 to 180 watt hours per cycle. It varies a little bit but nearly all falls into that range. So if we're looking at it from the policy maker point of view, a 20% improvement in that actually gives us marginal benefit per unit. So what we looked at is the bigger energy consumer, the, the water energy consumer. Um, and by assuming a 100 watt hour per cycle mechanical element, we, we took that away. And then we normalized for these differences in wash temperatures. Now, it's not perfect. And we didn't take account of all those other interdependent variables. But it's a practical way of looking at the critical energy consumption measure within the units. 
So we need to be completely transparent here and say the results you're about to see are somewhat dirty. They are um, the best that can be done within the limitations we have and the data that's available. But there's a certain degree of uncertainty. You certainly shouldn't be quoting the values that are presented on these graphs, the absolute values. But nevertheless, the analysis does give us a picture of what's happening in markets and a rough idea of the comparability. Um, the, this final dot point at the bottom says particular uncertainty related to normalization in North American results. That's true because of the mixed uh, wash cycles. However, North American units, so the Canadian and US, have similar issues, so they should actually remain broadly comparable. So the, the US and Canada, when looked at together, should be comparable with each other. And also all the EU countries and Switzerland should be comparable with each other. It's the absolute difference between them which is less certain. Okay, let's have a look at this data quality issue just for a moment. Um, the Annex as a whole has a, a mechanism to help people like um, you uh, visually understand the quality of, of the data you're looking at. There's three levels that are presented on graphs. Robust, which means you can be pretty certain the data you're looking at is it, pretty accurate and, and represents a market. Indicative, that means mm, the data is, is pretty good. There's some uncertainties about exactly absolute values, but what you're looking at gives a strong indication of, uh, of comparability. Illustrative, now that's much less certain. It says don't take the absolute values for certain. Um, look at uh, big picture issues associated with that data and, and, and broad brush uh, ideas. Now because of the specific um, original data and particularly the conversion issues associated with washing machines, there is no information that's about to be presented to you that is, uh, that is robust. Everything is either indicative, represented by a dashed line on a graph, or illustrative represented by a dotted line on the graph. It's important you bear that in mind when we move on, but nevertheless the big picture messages should be pretty representative. Okay, a quick look at the policies that are in place in, in the different uh, countries. Um, primarily two sets of, of, of major policy information, so there's MEPS, and there's labeling. Um, everybody apart from Australia and Switzerland has MEPS in place and, and recently Switzerland has been looking at that. Um, everybody has labeling. The interesting thing here I think um, is uh, the EU countries really have, have been dealing in voluntary agreements with industry. Um, most people haven't revised their MEPS very often. Canada and the US are, are the slight exceptions. Um, similarly with labels, okay they're all there, revisions are happening, but as we can see the, the, there are some issues with that policy implementation. Uh, so having given you that very quick background into the policies, let's have a look at the picture most policy. This is the picture most policy makers get to see. Um, it's the, the actual performance of the products on average in their marketplaces using their test methodology. So there's no normalization on this graph at all. This looks purely at uh, the declared values in each market. Now, it's actually not bad for the average policymaker. You can look at this, look, this is the US and Canada. US is the purple line, Canada the, the orange one. Bump it along the top. Um, and then round about here, in 2004 there's a big step which goes with the MEPS and a second big step in 2007. That's good, that's what policymakers want to see. Australia, this red line, um, there's a gradual fall in consumption. And the EU, well okay they're not getting that much better, but equally actually they're performing relatively well. But this hides some things. Firstly, obviously there's the difference in test methodologies and temperatures. Um, but it doesn't take account of market movements between machine orientation or changes in capacity. So the first thing I'm going to look at the normalization, so the comparative energy consumption within units when 
uh, normalize for this temperature difference in, in the, the test methodologies. Well, the first thing we can see is actually some good news. Machines around the world tend to be coming together around about a 0.5 um, kilowatt hours per cycle, normalized 0.5 kilowatt hours per cycle. Um, so that's good news. Things are beginning to come together. There's not big disparities between machines around the world, uh, which is one thing we want to see. Um, uh, there's pretty good reduction in MEPS here from Canada and the US and uh, down here in 2006-07. Again, due to MEPS, it's quite clear that there's a big impact there. It, it's affecting the market. But if we're honest, it's still only bringing it down to maybe just better, better than the EU. We're not certain about the absolute comparity, but certainly in line, maybe a little bit better. Australia is a standout here. The normalization process actually makes it appear even worse than it originally did in the first graphic. So it's now much worse than, than um, US and Canada. Um, but there's a cultural issue at work here. The, the Australians do have a warm wash uh, test method. Um, it's great. Um, it's broadly the same as everybody else's. However, people don't actually wash in warm water. They wash it in cold water. A vast proportion of, of washes in Australia are in cold water. And the, the regulator knows this. So while labelling the product with a warm wash, they don't actually aggressively um, tackle the issue because um, if they force the machines to work better in warm water, there's potentially a penalty in the cold water wash. Um, so, as I say, while labelling, they, they haven't aggressively uh, attacked the warm wa uh, water wash. Um, for a very sensible reason. So although Australia looks to be a much worse performer, it actually doesn't matter that much. But we were looking at the whole market and that actually hides some interesting trends. Um, we've picked two countries here because it, they have some of the best data to, to illustrate this effect. Um, we've got Australia and Canada. These are the same lines that are on the previous graph. This is normalized unit energy consumption per, per wash cycle. So this is the average, but top loaders perform actually worse than the average. And front loaders typically perform about twice as good as the average. Um, interesting to note that Australia is going up, but um, that's a volume issue which we'll look at in a short while. Um, some good news, the, the Canadian top loaders are approaching the, this nominal 0.5 kilowatt hour per cycle that the, the market is gradually going to and there's been a 50% issue reduction since 2001 to 2007. Um, but what's more interesting to me at least is the front loaders have been, been improving faster, top loaders are actually 42%, front loaders are 58% improvement over the time period. Um, but overall, the market in, in Canada is 78% more efficient. So there's actually this migration between top loaders and front loaders in both markets, which appears to be um, 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 exaggerating the improvement in product performance. Now, overall, that's a good thing if you're interested in energy, but it's important that policymakers understand that this, this lovely improvement they're seeing in, in product performance is only partially due to, to the actual regulations they're putting in place and, and the market management techniques. Um, partly it's consumer switching between products. Okay, uh, let's just have another look at this um, uh, impact of orientation and whether top loaders are actually better than front loaders or not. Um, this is Australia again. On this graph, uh, this red line here um, outlines the um, product performance of all front loaders, each individual, sorry, yes, all front loaders, each individual dot represents a machine. So if you look at the six, um, six kilogram load capacity line, each dot on there says, well, okay, the machine's performing between 0 uh, 0.05 and something like 0 0.25 kilowatt hours per kilogram of load 
So this is efficiency rather than energy consumption, but it, it's um, categorized by low capacity. So each individual dot should be pretty much absolutely um, comparable. This white line captures all the top loading units. So for, an in, uh, for a given capacity, those products are comparable. And as you can see, on average, the top loaders perform much worse than the front loaders. But what I find quite interesting and useful for policy makers, there's a number of those products in the, in the 6 to 8 kilogram range where the, the top loaders are performing almost as well as the front loaders. So this isn't necessarily a technological in, um, limitation that's happening in the market. It's more the management of the market and, and things could be brought much uh, close together. So ideally policymakers might want to encourage a migration from the top loader to the front loader and, and that's already happening in the market a little bit. But even if they can't, there's still this possibility of driving top loader efficiencies to be much better. So we, we can now see that the market, although improving, is not all about improving product performance. There's a, there's a migration um, in terms of uh, product type. So now let's move on and look at something else that um, is hidden from when we just look at the, the overall picture of consumptions. Um, this graphic shows the changes in rate of capacity of units in kilograms um, over time. As you can see in all countries capacities are going up. However the top loaders, the ones with two lines, are no longer larger than front loaders. This actually to me explodes a myth that's been around in the market for a while. Traditionally everybody's assumed top loaders um, have greater capacity um, and that explains why they, they need slightly more energy. That appears not to be the case anymore. In the EU and Australia and Korea, those values are actually declared by the manufacturer, so we can assume that the manufacturer believes that the front loaders are bigger than top loaders now. Um, in Canada, we've used a conversion from litres to kilogram of load. Um, that's included in one of the um, appendices to their standard. So, we can explode a myth. To me, there's a worry here. Uh, sorry, the myth... Um, the energy consumption for top loaders is not due to capacity differences. Um, uh, there's a slight worry for me for policy makers here. The, um, Korea, look at Korea at the top, the green line at the very top. They have units in the market now that average 10 to 11 kilograms. Um, there's a possibility that the rest of the world is headed in that direction. Whether consumers actually need that, whether they want that, and indeed whether that will actually happen in the market. Um, is open to question but certainly in, in China where I spend quite a lot of time there's now a lot of products in the seven eight nine kilogram range and increasingly they're beginning to appear in other markets um, now that has a, an impact on on energy um, in terms of the the efficiency as we'll see in a minute um, it potentially has a benefit but only under certain conditions it's certainly something for, for, for policy makers to be aware of So let's have a look at this unit energy efficiency, which is a measure of, uh, perhaps even a better measure of product performance. Um, uh, so in terms of efficiency, we're saying how much energy is required to wash a kilogram of rated load capacity. So this was the original um, normalized energy consumption with its falling values. That combines with this market effect where top loaders are actually migrating to front loaders. And we have increasing capacities. So energy is falling, capacity is getting bigger and this is market migration. So that brings us to the overall picture. Again, another one of those pictures that policy makers see. Things look great here. Even in, in the European countries where consumption was pretty flat, things are improving. Um, on a, a unit energy efficiency basis, so the efficiency per, per kilogram. Um, again, we can see big picture uh, the uh, the US and the American 
uh, sorry, the US and Canadian MEPS kicking in. And even on this measure, Australia is looking good. But I think I want to measure, uh, make the, uh, a note of caution. Um, we saw uh, capacities going up, but are we really seeing wash loads go up at that speed? The the Europeans have recognised this, and in their 2003 uh, 2013 regulations, they've moved to to more American uh, North American approach of, of of a mixed test cycle where they have different test temperatures, but they also have uh, full and part loads. Um, so they're trying to mimic the market a little bit more. Um, so uh, policymakers are at least aware that that it's an issue. And, and the fact that the fact that machines are really big, and so their nominal efficiency looks quite good, it doesn't necessarily mean that consumers are washing uh, those units full. Um, and so, unit energy efficiency may not be the best measure. It might be uh, policymakers might want to think about looking at consumption again, and recognizing that products are getting bigger. But maybe they want to say to manufacturers, if you want to deliver that, it's fine but you still have to address the overall energy consumption because we don't know what consumers are doing. I'm going to move away from energy very quickly and look at water consumption. This graphic uh, again is one of the typical ones um, uh, policy makers look at. It's water efficiency. So it's the amount of water used to wash a kilogram of load. Um, uh, people are increasingly interested in water, they're trying to drive it, uh, water consumption down, that's partly to do with its energy impact, but also water as a resource itself. Um, US have um, their uh, water and uh, water factors um, uh, that are regulated, particularly under Energy Star, and Australia actually labels products with water consumption. So it's increasingly important to policymakers as a resource in itself and looking at this picture actually things look great um, water consumption is falling rapidly um, water efficiency is falling rapidly sorry I ought to say however if we um, uh, look at it in terms of absolute consumption um, actually it's not really falling the, the improvements are generally due to increases in capacity um, so I think policymakers need to be aware of that fact. However, I'm not sure that they want to drive um, water consumption down much further. Um, there is a, an issue because of the interrelationship of uh, wash quality, wash efficiency, all those other things, um, that reducing the amount of water uh, much further, given the capacity of some units, um, it may be that the wash quality begins to suffer. That's okay in those markets where there's a, a defined minimum limit. Australia has a minimum wash quality. Europe, in their 2013 regulations, has a minimum wash quality. But in those markets where there's no visible recognition for the consumer, there's no labelling of wash quality, or there's no minimum standard, um, there, there may be a temptation for manufacturers to, to step back and say, well, okay, we'll sacrifice a bit of the wash quality. There's an argument, say, the market will decide, money, uh, consumers won't buy products that, that don't meet uh, a minimum wash quality standard, but this isn't a disposable product. Once you've bought one, you're really stuck with it for, uh, for a period of time, so the particular quality of wash of this unit that I've just bought is hopeless, but I can't do much about that. Therefore, maybe policy makers, if they do want to continue driving down water consumption, do want to address wash quality where there's not currently a measure or any market information or regulation on that aspect. So just to summarise where we've got to, um, unit energy consumption in normal uh, countries is converging to this normalised 0.5 um, kilowatt hours um, per cycle. It's a relatively tight band, we don't know the absolute number but it appears machines around the world are performing mm, pretty well um, similarly. Uh, we've seen from the US and Canada that challenging and regular revised MEPS have a major impact on the market. We don't know how much further that can go because the, 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 the North American model is only currently brought it down to European levels. But 
because there's new maps coming in there's an implication we can go further um, uh, we've also learned that where top loader penetration is high in a market policy makers may want to encourage switching to front loaders which generally yield significant energy savings now we can accept that in some countries mm, culture doesn't allow policy makers to do that however we have seen that the the performance of top loaders can be almost as good as uh, front loaders and the capacity issues are no longer there so there is an opportunity even where policy makers can't encourage that shift to go faster than the market they can at least drive the top loaders that are being purchased to be significantly uh, more efficient and finally there's this actual load size versus increased capacity um, policy makers might want to think about limiting the capacity of units or capping energy consumption directly rather than using an efficiency you know unit unit energy consumption per kilogram as a measure um, it's a difficult one to introduce in the market because you're potentially restricting consumer choice but nevertheless you're really interested in overall energy consumption not the efficiency of, of these units therefore it's at least something uh, policy makers look, need to look at within the context of their own countries just two quick asides I said we we didn't pay any attention to wash quality that's not entirely true we didn't include it in the normalization where people measured it and we were able to gather that data we did it's important to know this graph is not um, comparative um, all we've done here is is looked at the changes in wash quality over time relative to the the wash quality in the first year data was available in a particular country the good news is everywhere wash quality is going up um, relative to its, uh, its original year um, but of course this is only in countries where it's measured we don't know what's happening in those countries where it's not measured and whether wash quality is being sacrificed for other outcomes similarly with spin effectiveness um, in this case down is good because that means there's less residual moisture in the in the uh, fabric that, that's in the load um, in some cases you know over time Australia has, has gained 20% improvement in the amount of water's left Europe's in 10% Britain's lagging behind a little bit but that's not untypical but nevertheless uh, these are good things the amount of water that's taken out of the uh, the wash reduces the amount of energy that needs to be dried in those countries where natural drying isn't used so this is this is a good outcome but again it only applies to those countries where we measure in it, it we don't know what's happening in other countries um, and policymakers may want to think about introducing some way where they can keep track of this okay that brings us to the end um, I hope you found it useful um, by definition I was only able to to give you an overview of the results we only had about 30 minutes to give you this presentation uh, there's a great deal more detail in the actual report itself which you can go from we can download from the annex website which is given at the bottom of, of this slide here and also the the website for our umbrella organization the IEA for a implementing agreement we'd encourage you to do that we'd also encourage you to look at a number of the other products for which there's there's the benchmarking reports mapping reports webinars presentations uh, we don't do this for fun we do it to help policy makers and stakeholders make sensible decisions about markets about their markets in comparison to elsewhere and to think about some of the issues as I say we hope you found it useful and um, we encourage you to come back soon to look at some of the other products.